Loading. Welcome to Access the Animus. Hello everyone and welcome to a new video here on Access the Animus. Today we're going to discuss our third and final batch of story news and speculations about the Dawn of Ragnarok DLC of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, at least for now, and this time it's going to be even more focused on the Isu story rather than the mythological side of things. In the video we're going to have a deeper look at Odin's personal story, having a look at his relationship with Baldur and Frigg and what that burning Yggdrasil could mean, before moving on to hypothesize what role might Loki play within the DLC, whether we might see him causing Baldur's death and whether we can see a mythological version of the Toba catastrophe at the end of the expansion. We're also going to discuss a few pretty huge story related elements that appeared in the recent deep dive trailer including a throne connected to the Isu Jupiter, the potential appearance of Minerva and a reference to an ancient version of the Isu or a civilization that might have predated them. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking it, subscribing to our channel and turning the notifications on so you won't miss any of our future updates. And with that out of the way, let's dive into the story news connected to the Donner Ragnarok expansion. So, while in our previous video we discussed the official path and purpose that Odin is going to pursue in the DLC, the other path that Odin will follow in Dawn of Ragnarok is that of a personal story, which was even advertised in one of the promotional pictures as Experience Odin's Personal Saga. Now we don't know many specifics about Odin's story in the DLC, apart from three major elements. The first one is that the DLC will feature Frigg or Frigga, who was Odin's spouse and the mother of Baldur in the Norse mythology and beyond the mythological veil technically should not be confused with Freya and whom we can actually see in a few shots in the deep dive trailer and in this screenshot, so as we already mentioned in some of our past videos we can expect some family drama, maybe get to know more about the actual Izu Frigg and Odin and their relationship. The second element of Odin's personal story is something that we can see in a few separated frames of the CGI trailer of the DLC and that is the Yggdrasil tree burning. We can see all its branches here with what seems to be Asgard in the foreground and the kicker is that it seems like Odin himself is the one who put it on fire. The same frames along with some other scenes from the CGI trailer have also been added to a little teaser that was added to Valhalla's game with update 1.5.0 that was released last Tuesday. Of course, this burning Yggdrasil scene is some kind of allegory, as it seems to be like a vision that Odin has and it's not clear if it's a memory like Odin did this before venturing to Svartalfheim as the roots of Yggdrasil in Svartalfheim do seem quite burnt out, especially in the deep dive trailer, or if it's a calculation for something that might be happening in the future, maybe Ragnarok itself, with Odin burning Yggdrasil as a visual representation for him allowing the chamber for the seventh method located within the Yggdrasil vault to be destroyed after the Asgardian Isu transferred their conscience to the human fetuses. Whatever that is, it looks to me like it's going to be pretty important to Odin if he keeps having flashbacks about it, especially while looking at his bloodied hand, and of course it involves the Yggdrasil and potentially Asgard, so… Finally, the third and possibly most important element of Odin's personal story here is of course his son Baldur, whom he is supposedly trying to desperately rescue after he was kidnapped by the Greco-Roman and North African Isu forces led by Surtur. Baldur is seemingly kept in chains as seen in the CGI trailer or monitored by several guards as shown in the deep dive one. He is seemingly located within some kind of prison, possibly located atop of a tower and it really doesn't seem to be just some random tower, it's shown a few times in the deep dive trailer, sometimes even with some kind of protective shield and also its shape seems to be more isu like than the rest of the buildings in Svartalfheim. 
While we don't seem to know much about Baldur's personality, at least until we get to read the Forgotten Myths comic or play the DLC, it does seem like even he is not trusting his father and we get that from the two Isu language sentences found in the trailer, where he said, will you abandon me father, will you save your true children instead? Here we see Baldur seemingly losing his hope to be rescued by Odin and starting to think that his father might indeed choose to save some quote unquote other and truer sons of his, and considering that Baldur is shown along with the burning Yggdrasil and Asgard in the CGI trailer, it might be possible that at some point Odin could be forced to choose between saving Baldur, his own actual son, and saving his own people and territory, hence why we get to read that Isu sentence by Baldur. I guess that soon we'll see if I'm reading too much into things or not. But that's not all that we know about the Isu Baldur. In fact, his name and his death too were actually mentioned in the main game, within the audio files of the Animus Anomalies. In fact, as you might remember, at some point after Odin fully imprisoned the Isu Fenrir, Loki's son, and after the Asgard and Jotunheim arcs of the main game, but before the Ragnarok scene, Loki retaliated and killed Odin's son Baldur or had him killed through the use of Mr. Berry. Now, the Don of Ragnarok DLC could be the proper opportunity to show that, considering that Baldur will work with Loki in the prequel comic and thus is likely to trust him, maybe even in the instance before he is actually killed by him. As we mentioned in our previous story based video, the Hogger Rip Bracer from the DLC might be mirroring the Draupnir ring forged for Odin by the dwarves, and in the Norse mythology, that is also the same ring that eventually Odin placed on the funeral pyre of his son Baldur. So we might also see something like that with the Hogger Rip in the DLC as well. And interestingly enough, it's not even just a theory, as when talking to VG247, creative director Mikhail Lozanov stated that, and I quote, Quote, One thing that inspired us when researching Odin and the sagas that surround him is a story about what happens when people pass away. So I guess we can really expect to see how Loki is going to kill Baldur through the use of Mr. Berry here in the DLC. Unless Odin witnesses other people dying in the DLC, like his wife Frigg, for example. From the anomalies, we also got to know that after Baldur was killed and after weeping his death, the Isu Odin traveled the world searching for ways to resurrect his son, and that's where Loki and Alethea planned to steal the Seven Method and use it for their own plan, which they did eventually as the Toba catastrophe was raging on, so we could expect to see any of these events at the end of the DLC or in a post credit scene. And following that line of thought, will this lead to the actual Ragnarok scene from the main game? After all, the Deep Dive trailer mentions that with Ragnarok incoming, Odin must fate fate itself, which is a nice way to say that Odin must face what the calculations from the Asgard arc told him about his predicted death at the hands of Fenrir. Well, technically the DLC shouldn't be able to show us the actual Ragnarok slash Toba catastrophe scene because Odin's genetic memory belonging to Eivor should stop at when he transferred his DNA after using the seventh method, but what if through some kind of narrative trick we're actually going to see the war in the streets of Asgard during the Toba catastrophe or what happened to Fenrir after he was imprisoned? Those are probably too many questions and I'm probably overthinking about this too but it must be called Dawn of Ragnarok for a reason. Hopefully? Before we wrap up though, there's a few pretty huge story related elements that have recently made an appearance in the deep dive trailer for the DLC. One is this throne and especially the symbol that it has on top of it, which is not a random one. In fact, that is the same symbol that the Isu Jupiter has on his belt in the early Assassin's Creed games and it's pretty much the same that his counterpart Sutunger is wearing on his belt and especially on his throne in the Jotunheim arc of the main game. Now, this could mean many things, it could just be some asset reuse, although it wouldn't have been shown like that in the trailer if that were the case, or it could actually show that Jupiter might appear in his Sutunger persona in Dawn of Ragnarok and even have a prominent role, which would make sense as he's pretty much depicted as one of the leaders of the Greco-Roman Isu, who are here represented as the Jotnar, and are indeed one of the invading forces in Svartalfheim, but there might be something more. 
In fact, you might remember from one of our recent videos that we hypothesized Svartalfheim to be the Norse representation of the Isu territory known as Atlantis because of the forges of Pieces of Eden that might appear in the DLC. Well, in Atlantis there was also a location called the Tinia Archive, which was an archive seemingly dedicated to Jupiter himself, which could or could not be represented by this room belonging to the dwarves slash Isu engineers, but that was seemingly claimed by Jupiter himself. Again, it's just a theory, we're going to see if there's any relevance to it. Jupiter or Sutengar's presence might also be supported by the second element coming from the trader, and that's the face of a female Jotun, who does look like Gunnlodr from the Jotunheim arc of the main game, who pretty much represented Minerva, Jupiter's daughter and the issue that sent messages across time to Ezio and Desmond. Of course, we don't know what she is doing here, I don't expect her to be happy after she was seduced and used by Odin, but that's another recurring character and one that is tightly tied to the story of the Desmond games, so there might be some interesting content for the hardcore fans in that direction. There are also two shots of the trailer that show a sailor of sorts and what looks like an anvil, each made up of blue metal or rocks with some gilded details on them. These seem to be some kind of altars or locations less tied to the mythology veil and more to the Isu meta story, at least according to the trailer, which shows one of them while talking about revelations on the Isu. It's not clear what they might be, maybe they are locations that contain some text files connected to the Isu lore, kinda like the Isu codices in Atlantis, you know? Well anyway, based on the trailer, if you're a hardcore fan and are still playing the DLC, you might be on the lookout for these. And lastly, there's a sequence in the trailer where Odin is talking to a dwarf trying to decipher elven runes. Yes, of course there's elves too, why are you even asking? This dwarf is saying that elven runes are not something that they can decipher easily and that these runes have been written quote unquote long ago. This is pretty interesting. Not the elven part, that's pretty bad, no I mean the ancient runes part, because I imagine this part to be tied to the Isu language, but not only that, in fact it states that these writings have been there long before the time of Odin, Jupiter, Minerva, etc. This is just the last of a few hints here and there that devs are or have been at the very least thinking of a civilization predating the Isu or at least an ancient and archaic version of the first civilization as we know it. Like I said, there have been other hints. For example, in one of the empirical truth messages in Assassin's Creed Origins, the Isu mentioned stories about the past and the future written on the walls of their temples, but they didn't know who had written them. Yes, that was also an allegory for time, but still. Recently, former game director Antoine Henry, creator of the Isu language, mentioned that the language as we know it contains remnants of an even older form of the language itself, leaving it open to interpretation that there must have also been a more ancient version of the first civilization that spoke it. And to a degree that shouldn't surprise us, we already know that the first civilization lasted for at least 2400 years, with the humans being created only in the last three centuries of such period of time, so it would only make sense that the Isu could find themselves unearthing relics from their own distant past or trying to understand a language written by people that lived a long time before them. And that was it for the third and final news video concerning the story of the Dawn of Ragnarok DLC of Assassin's Creed Valhalla and some of our speculations about what we might expect to see inside of it. And as usual, here I am asking, is this content, the one that we discussed today in this video, interesting enough for you to try and play the DLC? Are you a little turned off by the visuals and all the magical and fantasy elements? Or are you fully on board with this side of Assassin's Creed? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in our next video.